I tell you what, it's, it's not, not like, like the Alban days. days. I'm Rosie. I'm Jake. And today we're talking to you about the 1939 film The Wizard of Oz, which obviously is based on the book by L. Frank Baum, which many people consider to be a great book. I've read it as an adult. I didn't read the whole thing as a child. And in my opinion, for me personally, it's only a decent book. But when we were little, we had the Ladybird condensed version, didn't we? With lots of very colourful illustrations, which we used to enjoy. And then one day the film was on television. And so I certainly watched it. I expect you did too. And I was absolutely blown away by it, wasn't I? Apparently I had a phase of watching the recorded off the telly copy of it every day. Is that right? Yes, that's right. It was on a tape with Disney's Alice in Wonderland. And there was a time when that tape was always in use. We were watching Wizard of Oz every day and then a phase of watching Alice every day. The Wizard of Oz phase was when Rosie has to have her hair done like Dorothy to go to school. You had your Dorothy-like dress. And we played Wizard of Oz Barbies with your Barbies. A lot of Wizard of Oz film-inspired stuff around the house. And I do remember the first time I watched it thinking, oh, when is she going to get to Oz? Because it has quite a 15 minute, which to a child is quite a long opening. And I remember mummy telling me, oh, well, you can see how this bit's in black and white, but when she gets to Oz, it's going to be in colour. I think that's one of the quite famous things about the film. And when anybody like Earthworm Jim takes it off, they start off in black and white, and then they have the Oz bit in colour and for children in the late 30s even though they would have seen some colour films Probably that was quite mind-blowing. They were probably expecting to see the whole thing in black and white because they were used to that. Of course, when you read about it, you find out it's not technically black and white. And when you watch it, you think, oh, yes, I suppose it is sort of brown. There's some sort of filter technique, is there? Yes, I remember reading all about it a little while ago. Sepia. And, yeah, it makes the colours go brown. Of course, it would have been more complicated to do the film partly in black and white and partly in colour, so they filmed it all in colour and made the bits they wanted black and white sepia. Absolutely simple but effective. I remember I used to hate things that took ages to get started. You had to put up with boring bits before the main action. But The Wizard of Oz won the stuff with Professor Marvel. I never minded as much as some other things. I suppose I could see how it was important to the film as a whole. And it didn't take too long for her to get back and face the tornado. So that was always something in its favour for me. Yes, once I knew when the twister was coming and she was going to get to Oz, I didn't mind watching it. It was just wondering how much longer it was going to go on. But it is a very engaging opening, really. And what's happening is that a character who's not in the book called Miss Gulch is after Toto, who, as everyone knows, is Dorothy's dog. And some people nowadays name their cats and dogs after him. I wonder how many people nowadays know what the word Toto actually used to mean. Nobody who goes around using it quite happily, I'm sure, knows. Otherwise, they'd be horrified with themselves in today's environment. Yes, and Dorothy's small black dog being given that name would horrify them too. I also used to switch off a bit mentally when I was little with things that were in black and white. I used to think, oh, old-fashioned, boring. But I think, again, with The Wizard of Oz, I could see how artistically it worked, and so I didn't mind that so much. I always was quite relieved at the point where she opens the door and comes out into Munchkin Land, and as Mindy says in Animaniacs, ooh, Technicolor, and that's what we all think too. The book actually describes Kansas as being very grey and dreary, and Aunt M herself, after years of being a farmer's wife in Kansas, also being grey and dreary, so they definitely got the inspiration, that idea from the book. 
But uh, yes, you were talking about Professor Marvel and the reason Dorothy ends up running away and seeing Professor Marvel and him first cold reading her, as you were saying, and then warm reading her by looking at the picture of Aunt M in her bag and sending her home by saying that she's sick and someone's hurt her very much, someone that she loves, Dorothy has to run home to her. That's all happening because Miss Gulch has been trying to take Toto to the sheriff and I always once I realised more or less what was going on because I didn't pay much attention when I was little I always thought she was taking him to get put down but then if you listen to the dialogue it's only to have a sort of assessment to see whether he was dangerous having bitten Miss Gulch I expect the sheriff would have let him off really but then particularly towards the end bits of the dialogue and Professor Marvel cold reading Dorothy and guessing why she's run away they don't appreciate you at home and if I ever go looking for my heart's desire again I won't look any further than my own backyard she seems to forget all about people being after Toto's blood and we thought that probably a lot of that came from an earlier draft where even if there was any Miss Gulch she certainly wasn't trying to have Toto killed. Yeah, it's one of those things where an earlier draft is still evidence a lot once you stop and think about it. And the song Over the Rainbow, of course, so famous, is a big part of that old storyline. But they managed to link it in quite nicely with the Toto stuff. If only we could go somewhere without people like Miss Gulch over the rainbow. But the rest of the stuff that sticks through from the old premise, the old Dorothy wants to run away and find something better, it's rather anomalous once you notice. Yes, and when she wakes up at the end, and I think we'll come back to that point as well, everyone's forgotten all about Toto being taken off to the sheriff. So possibly Miss Gulch was in it originally as someone for Dorothy to have had an altercation with and be complaining about and to be the wicked witch counterpart in the real world but certainly she wasn't trying to have Toto destroyed. But then let's get on to this dream point now because it does link in with Miss Gulch and the wicked witch doesn't it? Of course everyone hates the oh it was all a dream ending except a couple of people who struggle with their English GCSE and want to finish their story like that. It's absolutely extraordinary and I have to tell them, no, don't do that. Think of a different ending and it's a tip in the GCSE exam practice books too. But in 1939 apparently you could and I did wonder and what made me think of it was reading a story by Louisa May Alcott where she absolutely insisted that a Christmas carol was all a dream and I thought it must be a religious thing because Louisa was very religious. So I thought maybe in 1939 for some reason Oz getting blown away in the twister and everything was incompatible with popular religious belief. I don't know if that's right. But then one interpretation that people like to make is that when Dorothy's up in the cyclone in the house, seeing people out of the window, doing their knitting, rowing their boat, waving to her, acting as if it's all perfectly normal, which is very strange, one of the people she sees is Miss Gulch, riding her bike like everything's normal. And then she sort of met her Morphoses into a wicked witch, and then it's not clear which wicked witch she is. An interesting interpretation, and I actually kind of like it myself, is that Dorothy's witnessing Miss Gulch being killed by having got picked up by the tornado, probably having realised Toto's jumped out of her basket on the back of her bike and come back for him. But because Dorothy is a child, Judy Garland was 17, but I think character's supposed to be a bit younger, isn't she? As a coping mechanism for this traumatic event, sees her, instead of dying, being transformed into the Wicked Witch and then when she comes back at the end, not having woken up, because people like to believe it is a really live place, that's why it doesn't matter anymore about Toto. Nobody wants him killed and it's quite a nice interpretation, but I don't suppose that's what they actually meant by it in 1939. I remember reading something on the internet that said the idea was that when the Wicked Witch of the West was sorted in one world, the counterpart was also sorted in the other one, the real world, so Dorothy didn't have to worry about it anymore. That doesn't make any sense, though. I mean, what the heck has happened to Miss Gulch in the real world? Is she kind of dropped down dead of a heart attack when Dorothy melted the Wicked Witch with the water? And indeed, I did always like how the Wicked Witch of the West goes. You're in your 
job and more trouble me than you're worth one way and another and that's a link back to her both the Wicked Witches being Miss Gulch in some way and I think that theory about Miss Gulch's death in the Twister links in with that quite nicely if you want it to yeah so if she was coming to reclaim Toto she wouldn't have been out on her bike at all and I always thought it was the Wicked Witch of the East in the tornado I suppose you can put whichever spin on it you like really I kind of thought Dorothy implied she thought it was in the song they're all talking and singing about the Wicked Witch of the East and then the witch flew past us by an inch etc etc and then we squished her yes I never would have thought it could be the Witch of the East if it hadn't been for those lyrics because that's Miss Gulch in Oz the Wicked Witch of the West so maybe it's a little bit pedantic but I always noticed that well which witch is she supposed to be of course we can't even tell if that witch is green because it's still in black and white at that point yes and perhaps the Wicked Witch of the East isn't green because as the Wicked Witch of the West appears to be green because the inhabitants of the West are green the winky gods are green. It perhaps wouldn't make sense for the Wicked Witch of the East to be a different colour from the Munchkins. But then the Wicked Witch of the West and the Wicked Witch of the East are sisters, so perhaps they should both be green. Or, we're back to the old Witch Haven from Nightmare question here, are they only sisters in the coven sense and not the biological sense? Who knows? That's the difference between the film and the book, of course. There have been a lot of changes for the film, for theatrical reasons reasons, things that just work better watching them than if you adapted it directly from the book. One being that in the book we never even see the Wicked Witch of the West until the wizard sends them from the Emerald City to kill her. Dorothy and the rest of the gang get sent to do that and she's really not interested in what's happened to the Witch of the East at all and there are some other differences we'll probably think of and point out and explain why they work better in the film. But yes, it does work having a single and antagonist from, well, the beginning really, with Miss Gulch and then from her arrival in Oz. And then, yes, let's talk about Munchkinland. I think my attention really was grabbed when she walks out into the Technicolor world and then along comes Glinda and her pink bubble and then the Munchkins appear and start doing this very elaborate song and dance routine. And when I was little I had never actually seen anyone with dwarfism. They didn't used to have inclusive television and things like they do now. And I remember saying to our mum, well, where did they get actual munchkins from? Which I think might horrify some people today that I had this attitude. But honestly, when you're little and you've never seen something, how do you know? So our mum explained and the word she used was midget and the word that the actors, singers and dancers used was midget. What are they called? The singer midget. And interestingly enough, I read it's because their manager is a guy called Mr. Singer rather than their midgets who sing. But it works both ways. They sing Ding Dong, the Witch is Dead, as everyone knows. And an interesting thing just while I remember is that there's a cut reprise of Ding Dong, the Witch is Dead, sung by the chief Winky with a very strange, very deep, voice that's obviously supposed to be a sort of otherworldly voice and it sounds weird of course he sings it after Dorothy's killed the Witch of the West and all the Winkies are pleased and I thought maybe it would have been a good idea to keep it because it does underline that parallel between the Munchkins and the Winkies and the Witch Oppressor but I guess it's okay to cut it. I got that even when I was little. Of course they don't use the term Winky actually in the film and this is one of the things we've always known from the Ladybird book. The Winkies to the West, the Quadlings to the South, the Munchkins to the East and one of the things that used to pee me off about the Ladybird book as the Good Witch of the North says and the North is my home and I'm like yeah but what are the little people called or they might not be little in the film the Winkies aren't little are they each one has a witch and each one has people as well with a special name and it turns out in the original book series it takes until the third or fourth book to reveal that the residents of the North are actually called Gillikins and that should be in the original as well 
Whenever I would watch the film when I was little, I would think to myself, oh, that's different from the Lady Bird book, about various things. The big one I remember is where the Tin Man goes, the Tinsman forgot to give me a heart, and I think, oh, yeah, well, he was originally human in the Lady Bird book, and presumably the original book, and that's true. And there were other little differences I spotted, too, including, as you were mentioning, the Wicked Witch of the West turns up in Munchkin Land. But I didn't mind that when I was little, as you were also saying it's good from a storytelling point of view artistically it works there having her as the running antagonist turning up there establishing her enmity with Dorothy immediately and the reasons for it but I was one of those children who doesn't like things being different in different adaptations of the same story so things like the Tin Woodman didn't used to be human and stuff used to annoy me slightly but nowadays I quite see that all the decisions they made MGM 1939 decisions were quite the right ones artistically to make such a fantastic movie. Of course, it is quite annoying that there is no Witch of the South in the film. Do you know, that was the one that always annoyed me most of all, because I hated things where there was an incomplete set. There should be witches of the North, South, East and West, and I was always very pleased that there were in the Lady Bird book. But of course, the good Witch of the South doesn't make it into the movie, except she kind of does, because Glinda is an amalgamation of the two good witch characters from the book. The Good Witch of the North, and Glinda, the Good Witch of the South, who's kind of described and drawn in the Ladybird book like the Witch of the North in the film. And that also, from a storytelling point of view, works. The wizard goes off in his balloon. You don't want to see Dorothy then going on another quest for another half hour in the movie. You want to see her get back to Kansas at that point. And Glinda turns up again, and things go on from there, really. Yes, in the book, they have to mess about with lands full of China people and that kind of thing, going to find Glinda, the Witch of the South, to tell Dorothy that she can tap her heels together and say that she wants to go back to Kansas. Kansas, because the power of the shoes in the book is that they take you wherever you want to go. In the film, again, they adapt that to, I won't look any further than my own backyard, and Glinda knew all along that she could get home with the shoes, but she had to learn it for herself. Mind you, they could have had Billy Burke appear in a different costume and say, I am the Good Witch of the South. Linda is my sister. Now I will help you go home. That would have satisfied me artistically and emotionally when I was little. I think a lot of other people would have found that a bit weird, wouldn't they? Suddenly saying that the same character is a different character. I can see why they didn't do that. Yes, perhaps artistically that would have been unnecessary and strange and just made the audience go, huh? Of course, what Dorothy does say in the film, and I nearly said before I forgot what I was talking about the book, is there's no place like home. There's no place like home which has become iconic and how many people know that in the book the shoes or slippers aren't ruby at all but silver I seem to remember they are silver yes I remember the drawings of them silver in the ladybird book and I'm sure that's taken from the original text but of course again they made that decision because they were making a film and they had all this fabulous bright beautiful technicolor you don't want silver shoes do you you want nice sparkly primary color red shoes shoes. But then of course L. Frank Baum gave them the yellow brick road, lovely and colourful. I always quite liked how there were two roads in Munchkin Land, the Yellow Brick Road, which goes to the Emerald City and also goes off into a crossroads, probably shortcuts to the north and south, and a sort of brown road, which is the Munchkin Land Road and goes to their equivalent of City Hall and stuff, where they find the Munchkin there. Yes, I always thought that crossroads was terribly unhelpful and it completely undermines the instruction of just follow the Yellow Brick Road. That's all you need to do. Well, it's not all you need to do. Sometimes I think, does the Scarecrow know that that particular cross that they take leads to the Emerald City and that's why he leads Dorothy down there as they're going off singing the song? Probably he does, really. That's what I like to think, otherwise it doesn't make any sense. Yes, otherwise it was only a 33% chance that they were going to go the right way. Which brings us nicely onto those characters, doesn't it? The Scarecrow, the Tin Man, and the Lion. As we saw on the DVD special features, played by the three funniest, most brilliant Broadway comedians of the time. 
Good thing they managed to get those three, and they almost didn't, did they? Yes, that's a very interesting story also on the DVD. Originally, the Scarecrow guy, Ray Bolger, was going to play the Tin Man, and some other guy was going to play the Scarecrow. But when you watch the Kansas bit with their counterparts, and you see Ray Bolger performing as Hunk the Farmhand and doing kind of gangly spinning round and shaking when he's hurt himself on the cart and stuff. You think, how could anyone have ever thought he shouldn't play the scarecrow? He moves like he's made out of straw. And then somebody realised this and switched around the roles. And this other guy who was going to play the scarecrow and then going to play the tin man turned out to be allergic to the tin man makeup. So they had to get rid of him, which was very hard luck on him, but you just do what you have to do, don't you, to make the film the best it can possibly be, including giving poor Judy Garland drugs to keep her awake and then drugs to put her to sleep at night, and wearing the lion costume even though it's unbearably hot as Bert Law had to do. But luckily, they ended up with the three funniest Broadway comedians, thank goodness for that. Just while I remember, some other woman was going to play the Wicked Witch of the West, and it says on this DVD special feature that told me this, that she went off in a strop when they decided the Witch of the West was going to be a black-hatted, big-nosed, green, ugly witch. Originally they had her as a sort of beautiful Snow Queen kind of thing, and I've seen on this special feature pictures of her in the costume, and then pictures of her looking completely peed off in the new costume. So she went off in a strop and they got Margaret Hamilton, whose performance is, like pretty much everyone else's, iconic, so thank goodness for that. Only bad witches are ugly. I mean, that's quite simple but effective in your black and white technicolour film, very easily accessible for kids. I can see why they went with that. You mentioned Margaret Hamilton on the Adams Family podcast. There she was, 30 years later, being Granny Frump. Wonderful stuff there. That song that they all sing with their own lyrics is always called If I Only Had a Brain, even though there's also If I Only Had a Heart and If I Only Had the Noive, which used to annoy me a bit because you can't really make the word courage fit in that song and they had to make up a different one. I always thought the Scarecrow's bit, the brain bit, was the best and the most memorable. It was the stuff that stuck in my memory and I could reproduce if required, first of all. I think it's got the simplest but most effective lyrics. You don't need random quotes from Romeo and Juliet and forced rhymes, like if I only had the nerve. Of course, someone realised he ought not to sing with the thoughts I'd be thinking I could be another Lincoln and got Dorothy to do that, who's from the same world as Abraham Lincoln. It always used to strike me how the lion says what makes the Sphinx the seventh wonder, and I think, well, that's not quite right, is it? So obviously they were right to not have the Scarecrow talk about Lincoln, or I'd have thought it even earlier in the movie. Yes, I actually missed that one. And Ray Bolger's performance I've always found very engaging, and when Dorothy says, I think I'll miss you most of all, I get what she means. Of course, they do a funny cutaway in Family Guy, don't they, where the Tin Man and the Lion are all like, whoa. This is awkward. I thought this was a team effort here. But then next, of course, they meet the Tin Man, which reminds me of how much fun Toto is having. The actor playing Toto was a bitch rather than a male dog, wasn't she? But you can't tell. And Judy Garland was ill-treated, as well as other child stars at the time. But for once, they seem to have treated the animal well. She had a wonderful time making The Wizard of Oz. And the Tin Man does more of an elaborate dance routine during his bit of the song. And Toto has absolutely loves it and jumps around after him, wagging his tail or her tail, depending whether you're talking about the character or the actor. That's the scene where they've got a couple of birds in the studio to add atmosphere. They've got a toucan and a crane. And apparently there was some myth that the crane, people had seen it in the background and said, oh, it's a munchkin that's hanged himself from a tree. But no, it's a crane walking about being a background star and adding something to the land of Oz. I think that works very well. 
I think they're away from Munchkinland by then anyway. I was thinking when we were watching it the other day, I suppose that cottage where the witch appears on top and the tin man's next to it is the tin man's woodsman's cottage. Yes, I mean, it's a long way to go for a munchkin to commit suicide, but I always thought the cottage must have something to do with the tin man. Okay, he didn't used to be a human and live in it himself, but the tinsman, yes, must have lived in there. And that's also the bit, well, just before they meet the tin man with the evil trees, and it's interesting to find out the main spokesperson evil tree went on to voice the crocodile in Disney's Robin Hood over 30 years later. Which reminds me that the person they got to say wherefore art thou Romeo which we were talking about is Snow White. And apparently Walt Disney was very protective of that actress her name's Adrian something and wouldn't let her do any other work because people like Walt Disney and Alfred Hitchcock could do that in the olden days the very olden days but uh, she's uncredited saying wherefore art thou Romeo me, I was part of the Tin Man's song. One thing that used to annoy me even when I was little was that his counterpart on the farm doesn't talk about heart like Hunk talks about brains and Zeke talks about courage. Hickory is the name of the Tin Man on the farm. They're giving her advice about Miss Gulch and what to do about the Toto situation and Hickory should say something about appealing to her better nature or something like that. It would work very well but all he says is someday they're going to erect a statue of me in this town as a reference to being the Tin Man. Well don't start posing for it now. Which really has nothing to do with what he's after in Oz and the lesson they're trying to convey about how things like brains and courage and heart you can't go and get from a wizard, you have to find them for yourself. You know, talking about the farm reminds me, and we were talking about it earlier, but I didn't say how much I used to find the tornado, twister, cyclone effect very effective. And of course, what would they do now? All sorts of CG rubbish, but it's really simply but effectively done. The footage of the real twister on the back ground and you've got them frantically scrabbling to batten down the hatches at the farm and it's quite a long way away. Dorothy comes back, it's noticeably closer, she's rushing around screaming for Auntie M, comes out of the house and the twister is right there. I thought that was a very effective bit of cinematography and it still is almost 80 years later and it just goes to show you don't need computers, you just need vision, a couple of different films and skillful filmmaking. Mm, that's fantastic and that reminds me as well of the effect of the Wicked Witch appearing and disappearing in Munchkinland in a puff of red smoke. They use a trapdoor, don't they, like in theatre? I really like that, the way they transplant some of these theatre devices and feel of being at the theatre onto the screen and works extremely well for the witch and her disappearing and reappearing in smoke and for the melting bit as well. Talking of the melting bit, an interesting thing is that in the book, Dorothy throws water at her on purpose because she's peeing her off. I mean, she's not going to have any idea it would kill her, otherwise she'd have done it ages ago, wouldn't she? But in the film, Dorothy can't even mean to throw water on the witch. She has to be throwing it at the scarecrow who's on fire. I think that's a bit soppy. She can't even deliberately throw water on someone without knowing it's going to kill her. That was another thing that always struck me. Oh, that's different in the Lady Bird book, actually, where the wizard goes, bring me the broomstick of the Wicked Witch of the West. And I think, oh, he's supposed to say, go and kill the Wicked which of the worst. And then the Tin Man immediately says, to do that, we'll have to kill her to get it. And I'm like, okay, they're going for that quite quickly. But why do they have him say, bring me the broomstick? Is it to try and make him seem a bit less harsh? I mean, he wants them to kill the Wicked Witch of the West because he's worried the Wicked Witches are going to find out that he's a fraud. Yes, even though he's a very good man, he does want them to kill someone for him. And then, of course, the third and final creature that Dorothy meets going to the Emerald City is the lion. And I was just touching on how the Scarecrow actually has his brains all along and the Tin Man actually has his heart all along, which is very much a theme in the book. And in the book, the lion has his courage all along and he confuses courage with bravado and he thinks that because he's scared, he doesn't have courage, not realising that because he does stuff anyway, like getting everyone on his back and jumping over the ravine, which doesn't happen in the film. In fact, he has courage in bucket loads. Which might make you think back to our Fantastic Max podcast. It did me while I was watching the film the other day. I was thinking about FX's cousin XS and his definition of courage. 
which is what the lion thought it was before he learned the truth. But actually, in the film, as he expresses it, he's just a dandy lion and does this limp-wristed gesture, which is, again, something we couldn't do now. But what he means is he is scared of everything and he doesn't do it anyway. He's always trying to run away from things. He doesn't want to go and face the wizard. He jumps out of the window when the wizard's been yelling at them. But then he finds his courage when they go to rescue Dorothy from the witch's castle and he does this whole I'll do it for Dorothy thing and I wish at the end of that speech he didn't say to them it's just one thing I want you guys to do talk me out of it and try to leave and then they have to physically turn him around and push him towards the castle but he does do it anyway Mm, he's not quite enough like FX and that Halloween Fantastic Max to make that really work if he did that speech and then got on with it that would be much better but he makes a speech and has a little wobble and then gets on with it so I guess that's okay and as the wizard once he's been exposed as a man a real human man tells him later in fact he does have courage so that's different from the book different from the scarecrow and the tin man and what they've tried to teach us but again for storytelling purposes it works he goes on a journey to find his courage another thing that used to strike me about oh this is different from the ladybird book is how the emerald city in the film is really an emerald city it's not part of the whole elaborate wizard's illusion everyone in the emerald city has to wear these glasses that make everything look green and so do you again artistically i think that's the right decision it's the emerald city they go around in it there's not really time it's not really necessary to have that be part of the wizard's illusion and have the characters wear glasses all the time and you can spot once you've watched it a few times how Frank Morgan who played the wizard plays all these characters they meet in the Emerald City and it becomes quite clear if you think about it but not that long that it's all actually the same person trying to put them off along the way in all different guises I was looking this time how when he comes in with his cabby outfit, you can see that the doorman's buttoned up outfit is on underneath his coat. He's just popped the coat on, which is quite an interesting thing to follow through, really, until they get to see the wizard seeing the guy trying to, as you were saying last time, put them off at each turn. Yes, and only when he hears that any of the witches are interested does he let them see the wizard. But of course he has his pyrotechnics and everything all set up in case he does have to let anyone in to see the wizard. Mm, I always quite liked in the film as a difference actually from the Lady Bird book how they stuck with just the one illusory form for the wizard, the big head, which I think worked very well. All this mucking about in the book with coming back different days and being a spider and being a woman and stuff. That's really unnecessary for the screen. I think having the four of them, five if you count Toto, all going in and seeing the big head illusion version. Very much the right decision artistically practically and then of course towards the end he starts refusing to grant their requests saying come back tomorrow and it's Toto who exposes him pay no attention to that man behind the curtain that's another very famous bit that's a much quoted and referenced and used line that's very much in the soup and has been for almost 80 years it's even in Hey Arnold the movie and then in spite of all this putting them off and not really planning on doing anything for them. He insists that he's a very good man, just a very bad wizard. And then it's only quite recently I was noticing that Professor Marvel, his real world counterpart, of course in the book it's all the real world, isn't it? And Oz physically exists after Mars and Mars and Mars are desert all around and that's why you can only get to it by hot air balloon and by a twister. That's absolutely right and it has all other surrounding countries that we haven't discovered yet where people, antagonists like the gnomes King live. But getting back to Professor Marvel, I was noticing he's a very good man, but a very bad psychic. It takes him a long time to work out that Dorothy's running away, and it's quite ironic when she says, oh, it's like you could read my mind. He has a load of guesses first, and he makes her close her eyes to look in her bag and stuff, and pretends he's looking in this crystal ball. He's not a very good psychic, but he is a very good man, and makes her go home. And when she's going home, he's saying to his horse, or himself, but handling his horse at the time, poor little kid, I hope she gets home all right. So that's a very interesting parallel between the two worlds. Mm, his horse, Silver 
Sylvester is a character I enjoyed, and of course I suppose he's the counterpart of the horse of a different colour in many ways. Yes, of course. I'm not sure what Professor Marvel's planning to do with him during the Twister, but I guess he's got somewhere to put him. Yes, they're going to get undercover together in some sort of strong bond with foundations, I explain. I like the bit where he doesn't remember his own false advertising slogan and Dorothy says they're going to go off and see the crown heads of Europe and he's like, oh, do you know any? Oh, no, that's right, they're my friends. Oh, you mean the thing? Yeah. He says. He's got it written on the side of his wagon. It's very good. I think he was quite famous, Frank Morgan, and they did use him as kind of a pull for the movie, Judy Garland and Frank Morgan as the wizard. And I can see why people used to enjoy him in those days. I've just remembered remember there was talk of Shirley Temple playing Dorothy, but I think Judy Garland was the right choice in the end. Everyone loves her in that. Getting back to the denouement, though, with I don't think there's anything in that black bag for me. There are so many really famous lines, aren't there? That's another difference from the book. And another one that I always notice being different from the Ladybird book. And when I was little, I don't know about you, but I didn't like it much. I used to think he should stuff something into the scarecrow's head and say, there you are, that's some brains. But actually, it's better that he doesn't, that he gives him his diploma and says, basically, well, you had brains all along. Gives the tin man his token of esteem for being a philatelist, a good deed doer. It took me ages to work out I was trying to say philanthropist, because I didn't know that word when I was little, which is a sort of heart-shaped clock thing. And he kind of sticks it onto his chest as if he kind of thinks it is an actual heart or will do anyway. Yeah, that's right. The way he goes, oh, it ticks. I don't think the tin man's really understood the lesson he's supposed to have learned to the same extent as the scarecrow and the lion. Yes, the lion, of course, getting his medal which says on it, courage, ain't it the truth, ain't it the truth. He's got a bit big-headed about his newfound courage, but yes, that's a good lesson to teach children, actually. These things come from deep inside yourself. Do you know, that's another difference that I saw was better than in the Ladybird book, even when I was little. I thought, oh, yes, I suppose he doesn't need to stick pins in the scarecrow's head, making him realise that it all comes from within anyway, is much better. Oh, and the same with the lion and his medal. But not quite the same with the Tin Man. He does kind of give the Tin Man a make-do heart. Mm, If you'd given him a token that wasn't heart-shaped, then perhaps the Tin Man would have got it. But then I noticed a bit later how the wizard does try to make the Tin Man learn the same lesson. A heart is not judged by how much you love. Blah, blah, blah. But visually, it doesn't quite come across in the same way or in as good a way as with the Scarecrow and the Lion. You know, I remember when we went to see a stage adaptation of The Wizard of Oz at one point when we were little. The wizard, instead of having a balloon, claimed to have a rocket ship experimental rocket ship that he'd come to Oz in. And he gave the placebos in some way to the three others and then took Dorothy off stage going, come Dorothy, our rocket ship awaits. And I think, oh, what's going to go wrong with the rocket ship? It won't work like the balloon. And then the next scene, oh, they're back in Kansas. So it seems that the wizard did actually come through for Dorothy in that version, but mostly he doesn't. No wonder I've forgotten all about that. It sounds terrible. Another character I would like to talk about just briefly is Nico, who's in the cast. And I can't remember the name of the actor who plays Nico, but it took us ages to find out who he was. We used to think maybe he was the chief Winky who had a speaking part. But in fact, Nico doesn't have a speaking part. He's the head flying monkey. And I looked up the name of the actor on the internet, and it said he was a dwarf actor. They may have not phrased it exactly like that. Most famous for playing animals on stage and screen including the chief flying monkey from The Wizard of Oz, so I thought that was very interesting. And he does a couple of things, including smiling and clapping in a very realistic monkey-like way when the witch is melted, showing that the flying monkeys too are pleased at the death of the witch. Mm, they're one of those sorts of creatures that are not inherently evil, but can and have been used for evil. And in the film we do get a glimpse of the golden cap 
that controls the flying monkeys. And there's loads of things one can say about that in the Muppet Wizard of Oz, where you get a lot of these things that are in the book, but not the 1939 film. Such as all four witches, all played by Miss Piggy. They've adapted that into these kind of motorbike monkeys with this, this motorbike hat. And at the end, Dorothy, played by Ashanti in that film, gives it to the head of the monkeys. The monkey gets the hat, which is a very good idea and just what a hero is supposed to do with an item like that that controls a race of people, give it to the chief so that they can be their own boss. And I always thought that in the Ladybird book, Dorothy had done that, given the hat to the chief monkey to free them all, because Dorothy had had the hat, but it said that the Good Witch of the South gave the hat to the monkey, even though Dorothy had been in charge of it and called the monkeys to fly them round. Takes away a bit from Dorothy as the heroine, really, saying the Good Witch of the South gave it to the chief monkey. And, you know, I don't remember it being mentioned at all in the original. So in my head, Canon, definitely the Good Witch of the South is in it at the end, but Dorothy gives the monkey the hat. But L. Frank Baum wrote that book a long time ago, and I should think, like most other people, his contemporaries, he was fine with what he saw as inferior races being controlled by more human characters, even if it is a witch. Hierarchy based on how human you are, how evolved you are, we've got past those ideas now, which is very much why they thought of having the monkey gets the head and the Muppets, I should think. But yes, they're holding it in the witch's castle, the witch and Nico, and kind of changes hands at one point, and you never see it again, so I guess they were thinking of doing something with that but then they didn't bother. But nobody else controls the monkeys besides the witch in the film. They seem to be residents of the West, like the Winkies, and all that happens is that she sends them to go and catch Dorothy and do what you like with the others. So they just tear up the scarecrow a little bit, and the Tin Man and the Lion have to put him back together. I was reading that Chief Winky is credited on some sort of remastered version, and I believe it even is where they've put the reprise of Ding Dong the Witch is Dead back in. So somebody said, oh, we better put him back in the cast there. He's got quite a big speaking and singing part now. But of course he is credited as Winky God, and I think if you see like bits of scripts and stuff, it describes the Witch's Guards as the Winkies. That's something they've obviously taken from the book, and knew what they were doing with taking it out of the book, but didn't make it into the script of the film. Nico in that cast always reminds me of Pig Boy in the cast of Masters of the Universe movie. It's one of those roles that you have to do a lot of research to find out who it actually is, and you go, oh, right, that's a bit weird. You'd never have known that just from reading the cast and watching the movie. Yes, yeah, so it's not as if anyone called Nico by name. Of course, the flying monkey effect nowadays would be scorned by the modern generation as looking like absolute rubbish, but considering that it was 1939, it's brilliant, and I believe there was a whole massive fleet of flying monkeys after Dorothy and the rest of the gang. It takes watching the movie on DVD on our big screen television, which is probably quite small by modern standards. It's 30 inches, I think. But it's certainly wider than I really think a television should be. It takes that to spot things like the flying monkeys, most of them are a couple of puppets on a string flying across, and the witch coming out of a castle is just a couple of bits of black rag on a string. You don't notice it, and it doesn't matter, and it all works very well. Well, I think we were saying something similar about Back to the Future 2. It took a big telly and a DVD to spot the mixing up of different biffs, for example. Oh, goodness, yeah. But with the flying monkeys, okay, there are some puppets bobbing past the window, and then they've got, like, specks flying away, so it looks like they're in the distance, and it looks like a huge fleet of terrifying creatures. Brilliant. And, of course, Nico jumping out of the window, being the leader, joining the flying throng, and it all looks like the same thing, and the effect is brilliant, and couldn't achieve anything better nowadays with CG. Couldn't achieve anything as convincing nowadays to see you. Just thinking about a few little things to mention. There's a couple of little things from the book, like that cat that kind of get used but kind of don't. Or maybe just the one I'm thinking of, the witch kissing Dorothy's forehead. And in the book, it explains that she's protected by the kiss. And is that the case in the film? Those slippers will never come off. 
as long as you're alive. Is that because Glinda kissed her on the forehead? Because she did, but she didn't say why. Mm, it's interesting, that little things to spot from the book that you can infer meaning into if you know what they are, and if not, they'll just be very throwaway. A bit like the Harry Potter movies, really. There are things like that. I always noticed that they bothered to have Dorothy smack the lion on the nose when he attacks Toto. A very specific thing there. That just struck me when I was little. Oh, I should smack him on the nose just like in the book. One more thing I've just thought of is that Glinda doesn't have a Kansas counterpart. But at one point, I think one of us read that originally they planned for A&M to be Glinda, which makes a lot of sense. She's at one stage stood up to Miss Gulch for Dorothy, as Glinda does with the Wicked Witch of the West. And she's a positive female influence in her life. But I think it was decided that the woman playing A&M was too old and would look too much much like a bad witch and then they got someone else to play Glinda Billy Burke and actually on our DVD and large-ish television she looks quite old herself but I guess no one noticed in the 1930s yes you look her up you find out she was over 50 so it's not surprising that DVD pictures show up the fact that did used to annoy me, actually, that Glinda didn't have a counterpart in Kansas. And it didn't really that Auntie M didn't have a counterpart in Oz, because Uncle Henry didn't either. So that kind of made sense to me. But nevertheless, it would make a lot of sense to have Aunt M and Glinda. And in many ways, it's a shame they couldn't really go with it, but never mind. So there we are, a pretty full podcast about The Wizard of Oz. Hopefully you'll join us again next time, which will be the final Sunday in October, as we delve back into the BBC sitcoms pool for a podcast on the Thin Blue Line, which in many ways will follow on from a couple of podcasts we did earlier this year, Blackadder and Mr Bean, more about Rowan Atkinson and his 90s sitcom offerings. So until then, good night out there, whatever you are.